Welcome okay. to the uh, oil and gas uh, IIoT and, and remote O&M uh, webinar uh, this morning. And uh, let's expand this slideshow here. Get started. So there is a, a tremendous opportunity uh, in the oil and gas industry to uh, further the uh, industrial Internet of Things. And, and we believe that uh, remote O&M is going to be playing a bigger and bigger role. Uh, here are the people that are signed up uh, for the webinar today. And um, hopefully uh, uh, some of them have been tardy joining us, but will be joining us as we move uh, forward here. And of course, we are recording it, and all the, the recordings are um, in the service that we provide. The oil and gas industry uh, has already embraced IIoT and remote O&M, and uh, we'll spend $31 billion for these services just this year, and that'll be rising at 13% per year through 2030. But the, as a percentage, the expenditures uh, in this area will rise from about 1% of oil and gas capital and maintenance expenditures uh, to, by 2030, as much as, uh, as uh, 10%. And, and, but that needs to be defined a little bit, and we'll get into that in a minute. But NAFTA will account for about 50% of the 2030 total due to the tight oil and shale gas production and extensive use of IIoT and remote O&M with these technologies. And the Middle East will be second with CIS third and uh, Africa in the fourth place position. Uh, East Asia could be a much bigger player depending on coal to syngas, and that could be huge uh, with the Sinopec $30 billion pipeline but it's not at all certain that all of this will go through. But if it does, uh, China will be pretty much self-sufficient in gas through a thin gas from the, from the northern and eastern uh, coal fields. So the uh, IIoT and remote O&M by region is displayed here, and we won't go into those details at this, at this point in time but it is in the report. And the uh, market really uh, will represent about 1.5% of relevant CapEx and OpEx in 2017. By 2025, it rises to 3.2%, and then anticipating a very rapid rise to 10% of expenditures by 2030. But I think it's good at this point to explain how we arrived at these numbers, because we've taken a different perspective and definition uh, than anybody else here. What we're saying is uh, our, our $31 billion total for this year really only includes $13 billion of actual IIoT uh, revenues. But there's an $18 billion market that is all the existing products sold through new routes. So that if you're not on the IIoT bandwagon, uh, you may miss out on that $18 billion that is business that would have been sold somehow, but now it's going through a new route. And that new route opportunity is going to expand to 48 billion by 2025 and the actual increase in revenues with smart products and automation will in increase to 32 billion so we've taken a uh, a different perspective on it but it's the one that if you're marketing products um, you have to consider uh, if you want to weigh the importance of being supplying smart products, collaborating with all the people that to whom you can uh, uh, provide services and products. 
the uh, well, what what we believe is that there's been a, under the, the what has been underestimated is the need for IIOW, which is the Industrial Internet of Wisdom, uh, to empower IIoT, and just take a kind of ridiculous sample that you've got these sensors that relay the information to an edge computer, and in seconds, you know, you've got it going to the cloud where data analytics provide an, provide an actionable analysis. And with our present system, you could have an absurd example where the results go to the to uh, uh, submitted as part of a draft of a paper that's sent to a publisher who undertakes peer review and editing, and three months later the data may arrive. So there's completely incompatible something that's happening in seconds, and the IIOW uh, system that takes months for it to actually percolate through uh, the system. So we believe there's a fundamental uh, change that has to be made. We're involved in, in much of it, some of it anyway, and that uh, part of all that is subject matter experts. And IIoT will generate the equivalent of millions of white papers on a continuous basis. So you've got a, a valve or a pump or whatever, and there's continuous information about it uh, that can be paired, compared to all the other pumps or valves or scrubbers or compressors. And this opens the opportunity for niche experts who can use the data and, and apply it to a very narrow niche and take advantage of all this new information. But what you need really is a way for these experts to interface with people at different plants in the same company uh, to interface with suppliers, suppliers interface with each other, and all of these people to take advantage of the experience in the other industries and geographies. Decisive classification is just as necessary in, in IIOW as it is in IIoT. And so McIlvain is, uh, taking some modest steps such as um, defining a lot of the technical options in both English and Chinese, giving a numerical financial identity uh, number to both end users and suppliers worldwide, and particularly to nail down the identity of, of Chinese companies who can be uh, have, have English spellings in a number of different ways. Uh, using the U.S. standard industrial codes, but with a McIlvain subclass, uh, dividing the geographies precisely, and uh, defining products. So, uh, you know, something like choke valves, which is the definition of which by some is describes a design of valve, and others describes an application. So, the, you, if you can't get precision in English, precision in these other languages is is impossible. And so McIlvain is working to provide organized systems to gather the information on large end, end users, uh, such as Cinepec and ExxonMobil and, and others. And the um, um, beta site that we have is called BHE Energy and Supplier Connect, and it provides data on all the 70 compressor stations, gas pipelines, and 200 power plants operated by BHE. The, um, another beta uh, activity that we have is to create a uh, high-performance valve classification program. And right now, there's four or 500 slides for, uh, for uh, on choke valves, gate valves, uh, molecular sieve switching valves, and in the power industry on uh, uh, valves for uh, steam. So that is going on as well. So the uh, oil companies are u utilizing uh, IIoT uh, pretty extensively already, and they're certainly going to do a lot more. 62% uh, of the oil and gas executives uh, are expecting to 
invest more. The uh, 70% compound annual growth rate is expected for devices on oil extraction sites. And the uh, growth of the industry is being uh, robustly predicted by many of, uh, of the pundits. Uh, again, we believe that the, uh, a lot of the expenditures will be for remote monitoring and support, and uh, that will uh, facilitate software as a service and data analytics. And data analytics, in turn, will include IIOW. And so the people that need to be available 24-7 to take the data analytics and to take it to the next level is what needs to be developed. The uh, CapEx in the industry uh, is around, uh, depending on the years, can be over the last few years has been as low as 700, as high as a trillion dollars. So the uh, it only takes a modest amount of percentage of that in the IIoT sphere to create a pretty big market. We've determined the size of the future markets through 2040 in part using the EIA assumptions and their assumption is that over the next uh, 20 or 30 years or so, 20 years, that the oil price is going to hover around uh, $109 a, a, a barrel and gas will be around $5 a, a million BTU. Uh, US GDP will be uh, around a little over 2%. So these are uh, some of the forecasts that uh, that we are relying on from EIA in our, our projections. Uh, there has been a 20% increase in, in oil rig counts just since July 2016. And so there is a, a rejuvenation certainly of the US shale uh, oil industry and it's expected to gain momentum from mid 2017. And of course, tight oil is where the the future is, but tight oil is also where you've got the most complexities and the most need for the IIoT uh, and remote O&M. So the EIA uh, statistics show a robust increase in tight oil in the base oil and the base forecasts. Uh, and on the gas side, tight oil, of course, has the supplementary gas, and then you've got shale gas. And the costs continue to go down. The uh, product is competitive. The resources look like they're there for the longer term. So you see, for instance, there's a new coal-fired power plant uh, just approved here in the United States. But with the price of uh, gas being what it is here, the likelihood of that plant going through are probably uh, is probably nil. Plus, the push will likely be on distributed generation, GE saying that the average plant size for power generation will be 100 megawatts in the future rather than 1,000. So food for thought there. The um, With all this gas and, and the potential for exports, that LNG exports uh, uh, are likely to be a significant uh, opportunity and therefore a part of the uh, program for IIoT suppliers uh, in the US. Some of the biggest opportunities will be created uh, by regulations, for instance, uh, Honeywell and Arion. In fact, I'm gonna get into that in just a minute. So let's go on to the software. And the Honeywell Inspire program brings together customers, equipment, vendors, process licensors and the Honeywell experts to uh, provide uh, answers to operational challenges. So Dover Energy uh, is one example uh, of a company that's collaborating with their Windrock monitoring and analytical systems and uh, well site automation suite. And the two are 
uh, teaming up uh, with a larger consolidated data set, manufacturers can apply higher analytics for more detailed insights and scale the data as needed to meet the varied needs of single site or enterprise operations, leverage a wider pool of data experts for monitoring analysis. And this wider uh, pool of data experts is in its infancy and certainly somebody like Honeywell who has many of the world's experts in the refining industry, for an example, has an opportunity uh, to generate IIOW uh, revenues as well as the IIOT. So let's take an example here. Honeywell and Arian are, are collaborating on solutions to, to boost the safety, efficiency, and re reliability of their uh, operations. Uh, so the Arian has got the air emission solutions, including uh, flaring, uh, the handling of the gas from the wellhead to the gas station, uh, vapor recovery units. But there are complexities in these processes, and, and McIlvain has studied uh, a lot of this uh, flaring versus uh, capture of gases. And there's trade-offs. So for instance, the additional in CO and VOCs can be eliminated, but only by increasing NOx and CO2. So you have to have a balance, and that's where your data analytics comes into play. Uh, regulations vary from state to state. So what may be the best trade-off in one state may not be in another. And fugitive emissions are another consideration. And now you can measure those fugitive emissions uh, uh, with new technology so that that can all be incorporated in, a, in your cloud uh, decision systems. Now with the regulations, in some cases, preliminating flaring, gas has to be recovered even if it can't be economically put through a pipeline, but it can be converted to LNG uh, or compressed uh, gas and used right with a diesel engine right on site. So Honeywell can uh, apply a lot of its own software like the Experian PKS uh, for this uh, uh, collaboration and it's got a suite of advanced applications. Uh, Schneider Electric is another uh, player in the in the field and they would have the distributed control systems. In fact they have uh, variable frequency drives for pumps and they have a big effort to help pumps uh, help pump suppliers automate those uh, systems to optimize the design and then as you can see as you go from levels one and two upward that you would have the um, production management the process simulation and the uh, op operations here of uh, of the plant where you're relying on the, uh, the things like the optimization of these pump uh, systems and then on of course to Plant, plant maintenance, knowledge management, uh, and then all this allows you to um, do a better job on procurement. Another example, example would be Implico, uh, who's automating the complete supply chain in the oil and gas industry. A part of all this is uh, standardized automation uh, systems. And Sandy Vassar of ExxonMobil has been very much involved in this. Sandy, were you able to join us? I know he had signed up for it. Are you on the phone with us there? I guess he was not able to make it. Uh, but I think uh, we did include some of his comments there that basically you've got to reduce the automation cost by standardizing and taking automation off the critical path and reduce com customization and complexity. And he comes up with a number of uh, specific suggestions. RTI is a, a, a player you know, that's certainly uh, one of 10, P uh, 10 companies here that uh, have been cited uh, for their contribution to IIoT. And 
they talk about five contributions. And one of those contributions, for instance, is the automating remote operations. And at the well site, a high-speed DDS data bus connects all the sensors, for example, temperature, temperature sensors, flow monitoring, and actuators, uh, and flow controllers along with the process controllers to automate the process of drilling and completion. High-speed connections can then be used to monitor the health of the equipment, analyze activity, and log status readings, and, and more. An entire field can be integrated by combining local data bus instances. The system can aggregate hundreds of thousands of sensors, providing data to a control center for easy analysis, health monitoring, and data storage. So here's an example of deployment uh, in a cloud-based analytics application, which connects well domains to a private data center cloud. The processing bus facilities, the real-time collection and logging of well data are creating a repository for analytics applications. For high performance, a load balancer takes information and queues it up for processing. A single intelligence system can get data, process it, and drive appropriate actions and feedback uh, out of the active wells for optimized operations. Security, of course, is a big concern. And here's an example where the system de uh, demonstrated both protection of a previously insecure link and detection of many attack vectors through simple scripted analytics. Lastly, uh, the DDS hides low-level connectivity details and automatically handles discovery, routing, fault tolerance, and serialization. Startup order becomes irrelevant, and DDS maintains shared distributed state information. Application software is greatly simplified. There are a lot of associations and activities and standards uh, being developed that provide uh, open access. And one is the Open Process Automation Forum that has a number of uh, uh, well-known companies behind it and is providing this uh, open process automation uh, for all the different uh, industries, including oil and gas. Let's move on to wireless. The um, wireless is a key part of all this uh, and taking over from the satellite uh, methods that are used. Siemens has uh, three terrestrial uh, wireless technologies and they're used uh, in um, a lot of different uh, ways and gas field control and monitoring and rig power management pipeline telemetry, et cetera. And they have uh, wireless communications uh, connecting remote oil and gas production facilities around the world. For instance, a one offshore wireless network is using Siemens rugged com win wireless broadband technology, and it spans thousands of square miles in the Gulf of Mexico and has operated since 2011. The uh, I'm going to skip that and go on to the condition monitoring. Here is the Armand Lang uh, project. It's one of the world's most advanced gas processing plants, but is operated by a skeleton crew. In fact, Shell's goal for the facility is to operate and maintain the plant with as few people as possible. To do this, they're using online condition monitoring on virtually everything that moves within the plan, including the pumps and compressors, control valves, certain structures, and isolation valves. So a stated goal of the plan is that 70% of the maintenance budget and maintenance spending should be based on the results of condition monitoring. So it's used for the 41 most critical sh isolation uh, shutdown valves. Uh, and um, this 
rest of this particular uh, analysis goes into some of those details. <clears throat> but the critical uh, requirement was the ability to detect valve leakage and an innovative acoustic emissions uh, monitoring system is successfully uh, providing any uh, analysis uh, and any uh, valve leakage which is uh, occurring. And then this this uh, plant was charged uh, challenged with some particularly large valves that uh, created their own unique problems. So the data is always in the details here, but all the data is captured and automatically without user intervention. The data is processed and analyzed, and the results made available throughout the site uh, network, the wider shell network, and outside the shell network through the internet. And this is where, you know, what we believe is that you should have the valve manufacturer looking at this data, the actuator manufacturer looking at the data, and all the other components, whether they're the compressors, the pumps, and so forth. Potentially, you can have all the suppliers to that plant all monitoring the data so that the experts sitting in the control center there at Shell will be able to quickly turn to a valve or pump supplier for that extra knowledge. And so once you get the information in the cloud, it can be available to all these different people. So the end result is continuous real-time confidence in the condition of critical valves versus the unknown and often changing condition of not, de not, not, not detectable by periodic testing programs. <clears throat> The Horton Works, uh, who uh, did sign up to participate uh, today and may or may not be on the phone with us here, is supplying big data technologies uh, to a number of uh, energy companies, uh, for instance, Noble Energy and, and Centrica. And Noble is an independent oil and gas company, and where uh, predictive analytics help the company maintain their hydrocarbon infrastructure, and they also hope to use it for HTV. HDP to prove in, in safety. Cent Centrica is, is a big uh, uh, company that includes British National and uh, British Gas, and it is using uh, big data uh, technologies uh, and the data platform. Rotark uh, wireless valve monitors for oil and gas uh, monitor. Um, uh, the locations that and facilitate preventive maintenance. So you've you've got all these different uh, suppliers, and certainly the uh, someone like Rotork, who's heavily involved in the actuators, is a, a key uh, a company to be supplying things like the small battery-powered valve monitoring device that can be installed on existing or, or new valve actuators. And then you've got a, a RI wireless management system and a software management tool that provides operational and, and maintenance data in common with the industrial standard connections. Uh, so you potentially should have uh, the insights of your actuator people and someone like Rotork uh, would fill the bill. Uh, compressors obviously is another big part of IIoT, we've done a number of detailed compressor analysis. Uh, unlike valves and pumps, where we have ongoing daily and weekly services, our uh, compressor activities have been primarily uh, for individual clients, but we have been involved in a number of compressor analyses. And this is one example of an oil platform that's uh, equipped with the uh, monitoring uh, systems that uh, also uses the uh, expertise uh, of engineers who've modeled the behavior of a compressor and then determined uh, a lot of the parameters that uh, are important. And so you've got the uh, ability to uh, operate that unit based on uh, all those insights uh, that really required the calculations, uh, even down to impeller diameters and other aspects that uh, 
turned out to be relevant relevant for predicting uh, compressor failures and avoiding them. The uh, condition monitoring certainly for uh, lubrication is already very well advanced, and you've got a number of companies like Loggy Lube uh, here who are involved in all that. And Robus, Robusus is uh, providing compressor monitoring to the Columbia Pipeline, and that's another uh, example here. Arundo uh, is detecting and reacting to problems uh, such as caustic fumes, which would provide a corrosion on your uh, gas compressors. So that's another element uh, that uh, needs to be uh, considered as, as well. SKF is very big on condition monitoring for many of the rotating parts, including the uh, compressors. So again, you've got all these potential suppliers that can, due to the cloud, uh, you be uh, adding insights and any particular problem that exists. Uh, the Bentley Nevada, Nevada division of GE is, of course, very active in all this and has the optimization and diagnostic software that continuously provides timely and accurate assessments of criti critical machinery assets at the site. And so here are some examples, for instance, you know, a dry gas secondary seal uh, has degraded and reported uh, on the low medium pressure compressor non-drive end and upon inspection uh, the advisory of the degradation uh, uh, was confirmed. So by and uh, pinpointing that this has occurred you allow this timely uh, inspection and, and resolution. So again you've got the SEALS people that also uh, can be involved in in this and should be involved in this. And here's another example at the Kuwait Oil Company. So that com that completes the that end of it there. And I just wanted to also uh, show you some other uh, other other uh, relevant uh, aspects of all this. One is this is the uh, brochure on the uh, on the service that's uh, available here. And uh, we are in analyzing all the different industries and many of the different products in the IIoT and remote O&M range for many of the different industries. And one way we're doing that, too, is a weekly uh, webinar. So, for instance, you've got um, uh, upcoming is... Uh, Filtration and separation uh, next week, water and wastewater, and then air pollution uh, control IIoT uh, on April 13th. And then clean rooms and ultra pure water, uh, treatment chemicals, mining chemical, all these other industries. But relative to oil and gas, we're going to get uh, into a deeper dive with shale gas on July 19th, offshore on July 26th and then refining on August 2nd. Uh, we've already recorded and included in the uh, service uh, these uh, webinars from the previous four, four weeks. The, um, the system includes directories and company analysis as well as the uh, other aspects of it. Uh, and the so we do have a networking directory where you can go in and again I was like I was saying we have also the uh, a numerical identification so all the ABB companies all can be sorted with the one numerical financial uh, identifier and you can also identify the companies based on what their products are and you get to some pretty uh, detailed keywords, like just on monitoring, for instance, uh, itself. We uh, you know, do analyze the companies and company updates. 
and to get into uh, a lot of the other uh, other details here. Yeah, let's just get out of this one then. Let's see. Yeah. The uh, newsletter is the other thing I wanted to show show you, and the uh, the newsletter is a monthly newsletter, and you can see here that we have very detailed information on uh, the technologies, the activities. And then uh, even on the, uh, the, the Parker with uh, condition monitoring and so forth here. But um, we're also looking at the financial activities uh, and, and who's doing what, et cetera. So Danaher is moving forward in the IIoT space uh, and targeting uh, 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 it very robustly there. And then uh, Honeywell, obviously, is, is uh, making a big push in this area. And so we're covering that sort of thing as, as well. So that's some, some information on the report itself. Now, uh, we also are backing all that up with these oil and gas um, uh, activities that are specifically on the oil and gas. So, for instance, you can click on, on our intelligence system here, and on a daily basis, uh, we haven't posted anything in the last couple of days, but we will be catching up with it. But here's from a few days ago, and you can see the kind of, uh, of information that is being uh, published on a uh, continuing basis. So you click on these things, and they do give you more more details and things as well. But here's the summaries of, of what they're doing. But a lot of it does relate to the IIoT. And of course, things like the uh, uh, simulators uh, are another aspect that uh, is complementary uh, to the whole I IoT experience. So again, the devil's in the details, but you can see this is very, very comprehensive uh, uh, information. The uh, we, we do have the uh, analyses and things as well in here. So uh, just get down to some examples there. Um, so that the, uh, and, and this happens to be analyzing all the, the uh, gas processing. And for instance, just on the, uh, here we are at a natural gas uh, uh, process. And your dehydration re is, involves the molecular sieve switching valves. And again, we have a whole uh, analysis of r rising stem versus uh, a new metal seated ball valve and butterfly fly valves and so forth for these applications. Uh, we also are getting in to the mercury removal, uh, done some studies for Patronus on better ways to remove mercury in these things. So the devil is in the, in the details on, on that. And the, uh, the other thing that I was saying was that we really uh, need to bring all the people within a plant together. So in a place like uh, the Berkshire Hathaway, the uh, pipelines are just a, a part of, of all this. But you know, they, uh, BHE does operate 7% uh, of all the gas pipelines in the United States. So when it comes to lubrication systems for compressors or turbines, they would have those on the pipelines as well as in their, you know, all their gas turbine plants. And so these are all things that we're tracking. We have, if you click here, you get the, the details. But the, um, but the other thing that we're uh, doing there is um, because of distributed generation, someone like BHE has to be looking at what they can be doing to help uh, redesign a lot of these industrial plants that were, are within their area. So this is the BHE uh, Idaho area, and these are all the 
large industrial boilers and you can click for more detailed information on what is actually going on at those plants and what kind of um, air pollution control equipment and so forth there is there. So this covers, you know, all their wind facilities and all these other other things here. So in uh, addition to that, uh, we're working on a, on a technical basis. So we've done nine hours of, of webinars for their Pacific uh, Corp subsidiary that owns two power plants and was faced with a $700 million expenditure and uh, for NOx control. But here's where the IIoT comes in. Uh, some of these uh, webinars are with uh, a GE on their optimization systems with Siemens uh, using the uh, tunable diodes laser technology to measure all the uh, oxygen and CO2 in the in the boiler and reduce NOx uh, with optimization from that perspective. And then Emerson uh, has a, a system and there were several presentations by them as to how to get the NOx down. Uh, that combined with a novel way to actually remove NOx in the scrubber with ozone and a new combination of reagents uh, appear to uh, eliminate the need for the selective catalytic reduction. So there could be 100 million or 200 million saving on this uh, uh, project for these two to plants just based on the what we call the uh, the wise crowd additions, and this is where we're uh, emphasizing the need for the subject matter experts, because a lot of technology can move along a lot faster, and with IIoT providing the base data on the performance, uh, we need the IIOW such as this to take it to the next level. So that completes my uh, presentation this morning. I would be glad to undertake any questions that anybody might have. If not, uh, the recording will appear in the service and we'd be glad to talk to anybody about how to subscribe to that. And at this point, this is Bob McElvain signing off for today and, and thanks for attending.